Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series, At Home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Chitra Ramalingam, the Associate Curator of Photography at the Center, and I'm delighted today to welcome Neetha Madhar to our program. Now, before we get started with our conversation, I have a few housekeeping notes for everyone. Please note, first of all, that this program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted um, and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Nitha, and towards the end of our conversation, we'll turn to those and begin to answer them. Nitha Madhahar is an interdisciplinary artist, yoga teacher, and Buddhist meditator. Her work investigates notions of truth and the boundaries of the real, the nature of observation, constructions of nature, randomness and order, and the brain-mind relationship. Nitha studied fine art at the Winchester School of Art at the University of Southampton in the UK, and she did an MFA at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University in Boston. So she's long had a kind of transatlantic career. Her work has been exhibited internationally, including at the National Science and Media Museum in the UK, the Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art in Kansas City, um, and just last year at the Yale Center for British Art. Her work is held in museums such as the Government Art Collection, and the Victoria and Albert Museum in the UK, the Fogg Museum at Harvard, the MIT Art Collection, as well as the Center, where we acquired her Flora series last year through a gift from the Joy of Giving Something Foundation. At that time, Nitha and I began to get to know each other. And since then, we've had some wide ranging conversations about her work and her practice, about the nature of collaboration and about making space to breathe in tumultuous times. And today we're looking forward to continuing that conversation with all of you. Welcome, Nitha. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, thank you to um, the audience members for um, giving up an hour of their time to uh, join in with the, the conversation that we're, we're going to have for this, this hour. So um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So should we just dive in? Um, I wanted to kind of begin in a what might be an unexpected place for many people who are familiar <laughs> with your work. Um, so you have a long-standing interest in Indian miniature paintings. Um, and I thought that these two examples from the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford, which you sent me last month, might be a nice starting point. Many people think of you primarily as a photographer, but you know we've talked about how many of the themes and concerns and sort of preoccupations of your work can be teased out in talking about these two works. And so maybe you could just introduce us to them and tell us what you see in these and what they mean to you. Yeah, I guess in in some respects, they, they kind of bookend, uh, bookend kind of the, 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 the start of my, my, my formal training as an artist and kind of where I've, I've, I've ended up and currently doing, doing lots of research. So uh, the image on the left, uh, when I came upon this in uh, 1997, and I was in um, at the end of my first year at uh, Winchester on the, on the painting course, um, very interested in Indian miniatures, but I couldn't understand quite why I was interested beyond the fact that I'm so seduced by the, the, the pigments, the, the scale, um, how, um, how kind of narratives are depicted in the images. And so in order to try and understand my, my long running fascination, I um, was looking at Indian miniatures this at the time was in the collection of Howard Hodgkin, the, the um, British abstract painter. And um, I made a pastel um, study of it. And in one respect, it didn't, it didn't kind of give me the illumination that I expected by trying to work from the inside out by, by constructing it. And I subsequently gave this image to my, the drawing to my husband as a, as a, as a gift. And so we, we walked past it every day. It's currently hanging in our dining room. But I, Lately, I've I've just realised that I keep I'm, I've been making for the last year small scale A5 drawings um, on graph paper, and I call them jewels. And just even looking at some of the the images that I've made in the past, primarily my photographic work, I, I know that in some shape or form I'm still having that conversation with Indian miniatures. So when I had that real realisation, it I've just gone back to looking at them again. And what I'd really like to do is actually get to uh, deepen my understanding of how to go about making them. So the image on the right, which is called Yogini in the Forest, is, um, I think that was possibly, it's a 17th century work. That um, is in the Ashmolean, as is the one on the left now. So um, Howard Hodgkin's collection 
um, on his um, after he died passed to the Ashmolean. And I connect strongly with this yogini in the forest because of my interest in uh, yoga and, and, and meditation, because I am uh, an active meditation pr- practitioner. To see an image of a woman, an older woman, normally women, when they're depicted in Indian miniatures, they, they tend to be courtesans, they tend to be uh, royalty, they tend to be um, maids. So that's very, very much the, the, the dominant depiction. So it's unusual to see one where it's of an older woman that's actually has some agency as 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 a meditator in this this image. So I connect with her as a, as a as an older female meditator needing needing um, time and space and silence to be to be in nature. But it's even all those little details. One of my favourite details on that on, on this particular painting is the top right and how the the, the clouds have been painted and. They're not. They're not detailed. They're 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 they're, they're, they're quite loose in, in in a lot of respects. But those clouds really anchor the image. And and to my mind, I feel as though okay, they're not the main subject, but they're as important when my eye goes around the image that I I, I hone in on those clouds. So I'm as deeply interested in the in the depictions of nature as I am the main subject in that painting. Yeah, and I mean that kind of linking of. Um constructions and depictions of nature and constructions and depictions of different kinds of femininity through stylized form. Like I really see that playing out in your work as well. Right. Um, And I love about that cloud as well, the way that the, you can see how it's made, right? Like the swirls, the the swirls of the cloud are also the swirls of the paint and they kind of draw you around. Um, And that kind of pulls me then into thinking about your, your flora series where you kind of highlight the, um, the kind of constructedness, and the sort of the the careful artifice that's so visible in order to frame these these visions of of feminine identity, right? Um, so this is this is from. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Vita. I was going to say I found that connection really exciting because it was only in in hindsight, very recently, I think, when we started conversing that I I realized, oh wow, that Indian miniature reference and that look, I couldn't figure it out then, but I can in hindsight now, you know, a, a number of years later. Yeah. So um, yeah, Flora, it was a it was a behemoth of a project, <laughs> which began in uh, 2004, and um, having the idea for it, and then it just took a number of years to get various pockets of funding together, thanks to organisations like uh, Arts Council England, uh, also a wonderful photo publishing company in uh, in the States, Nazrani Press, who were instrumental to getting getting the funding and uh, the National Science and Media Museum um, awarding me a fellowship and so with those all those different aspects in place I I was able to do justice to the work in in the way that I that photographing um, all in all 17 of my friends who at that time were all within the ages of the, the, from the early 30s into into their 50s so um, classified as mature women. And uh, I had conversations with my friends and said, look, you know, I really want to, want to make some portraits that have that, that kind of conversation about a photographer and, and, and the subject and what kind of image gets constructed when we, um, we look at that relationship. And so the kind of conversations went over many months. We would pull together images and, and references, almost almost like having mood boards of, of, of things that we were working with. And I asked all my sitters to bring something of theirs to the image. So, for example, Sharon brought some, some, some jewellery. So that the um, images include a flower of their choice that had at some point, whether as a common name or less common, has been used as, as, a, as a woman's name. So the title of this piece is Showered Peonies. I've been looking a lot at the work of Madame Yvonne, heavily influenced by her, her Goddesses series from 1935. And I couldn't believe how intense the colour was in, in, in those images. And they just really stood the test of time, even though they were made in 1935. And all her portraits for this Goddesses series had, had the husband's name or the fact that it was, it was, it was never, never their, the, the, the sitter's own name. So it might be Mrs. Mrs. Balkan or something. It was, it was never their own name. So I just felt that I wanted to use a titling as a way to try and reclaim 
something of, of that that of their agency so that, that their first name is 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 what they have so all of the titles have that the first name of my sitter with the flower that they chose yeah like Anna with magnolias well this is uh uh yes absolutely Anna with magnolias and so there was there was some humorous elements because this is Anna Fox a very well-known contemporary British fine art photographer and uh, we couldn't resist putting a fox in the image <laughs> just to kind of have a play on her name. But this is also uh, inspired by uh, looking at the work of uh, another British photographer, another 20s. We, we were very interested in how he would co- construct these sets where women would, 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 would pop out of kind of holes in, a, in, 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 in the floor or from a wall. So, and the, and the, the lighting at the back there, that's, the, that's uh, a DIY version of the Aurora Borealis. Yeah, I mean, could you tell us a little bit more about the process of um, kind of designing and construction, constructing these sets and the, the lighting and the makeup? And Because like, I'm really interested in, I feel like this portrait gets at something essential about how we expect to engage with photographs in our everyday lives. You know, this, despite knowing better, we expect the photograph to offer us a kind of unmediated window on reality, mm-hmm. even though we're all aware the many forms of manipulation, whether digital or analog, are possible. And the way that you kind of mobilize all these different forms of non-digital manipulating of the woman's image um, through these kind of, you know, physical practices in the studio, um, and especially the manipulation of light, you know, not in the dark room, but kind of there in the sitting with the with the sitter. So these are analog, um, large format, um, four by five images, and then they've been printed in an analog dark room. And that was very important to me, um, conceptually for the project, because again, when you see the mature skin it's 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 always digitized and I just wanted to see what what could be done with using props and lighting and going through the analog process where you don't have that level of control for the degree of artifice that you can create because with digital you know I, I could have done anything. I wouldn't even need it to have been in the studio. It could have just all been elements, elements montage together. So that was very important to put a stake in the ground and say that that's one of the constraints I'm working with, that these are the most um, visually seductive images that can be made, working with the parameters of the, the sitters that are, are collaborating with me and using analog. And I'm fascinated by photography's relationship with truth as, as as anyone and you know I sit there as as in that position of being someone that's making these images very well aware that although there is um this difficult relationship to veracity that photography has and right from the get-go from 18 that it that but still we're still hoping to find something that gives us some insight into 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 truth um I I'm still um, engaged with that engaged with that question because it's it's something that's in, in, inherent to inherent to photography. So I love the idea that you know. So for example, this image is uh, Melanie with roses, and uh, I believe Melanie's watching this this, this webinar. So Melanie's a, a painter. So a lot of my friends are are photographers, painters, writers in in in, in, in the creative world. And this is a paint. The, the background is a is a canvas that uh, that Mel made, and um, she chose for that to be included in the image. And we were pushing against Manet's Olympia for this. That she has agency by the fact that she has she has the the, the paintbrush. And again, referencing Madame Yvonne, I like very much that kind of tension where you've got this beautiful, fantastical image, but yet. You might see the hands of an assistant in the image, or you might see parts of what holds um, some of the props in place might be safety pins or or bits of string. So there's a there's a kind of craft element or a, or a kind of low art element in in the making of them. And again, it's that. But still, even though you can see those things and you can see those things quite openly, you can almost park that to one side and go. But I can still fall into this into this image that I can still imagine that I'm uh, I'm transported through time and location somewhere else through what's being presented to me through 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 the frame. Yeah, that aspect of kind of staging and theatricality mm. in the way that you can be kind of drawn into the set even though you know it's a set. <clears throat> so you've got that push pull of it. Yeah. I'm still in it and 
and that came really in many ways from this 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 series sustenance um which i made between 2002 to 2003 when i was still at grad school at the museum school so this was my uh, mfa thesis body of work um i was living just outside of boston in a in a town called framingham and um uh, my husband and i had, had strung up some bird feeders out on on the tree next to our balcony and i was learning how to use a large format camera and i guess when you invest a lot of time in one location and you start to see the changes in things over time, I studied constructions of nature and staging and using light as a device to aid the visual seduction originated in, in, in this series and, and, and progressed on into, into Flora. Yeah, I mean, this, this series also always makes me think of um, dioramas in natural mm-hmm. history museums, which again, like gets to that issue of kind of hyper reality and this feeling that it's almost more real than the real mm. um, which is also a kind of common theme in, in photographic history um, and basically you're kind of drawing back on our earlier conversation as well you also have that um, about Indian miniature paintings there's that feeling of the kind of like this flat box of reality these hyper intense colors and this attentiveness to these details in nature Absolutely, that attention to detail that you can get through using, you know, this beautiful large format film. It, it to be fast, you have to slow down, you have to be patient, but it rewards you with that detail. And as you say, just like uh, uh, in Indian miniature painting, and I was very conscious of dioramas when I was making this. I mean, I love them, and I I find them fascinating that you could be in a in a essentially a six foot wide vitrine, say, and you've got this compression of time. And you've got compression of location that um, uh, flora and fauna that wouldn't ordinarily have, have, have you know, they might have been uh, a, a few million years apart, suddenly yeah. they're in a retreat together. So there is some kind of cons- constructed uh, knowledge that's being, that's being offered to us. And again, it's that. And yet I know that this is a construction, but still there's something about this that's, that's deeply engaging and... Um, initiating a whole a whole set of thoughts yeah and there's many there's sort of multiple time scales at play as well because you're also sort of you know tracking the changing of the seasons and the falling of the leaves and the sort of like the same spot returning to it again and again and again with a kind of attentiveness to whatever might present itself right the temporality is embedded i mean you know again one of the kind of tropes with photography is 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 time and you have that frozen moment but when you can see a series of images and it's 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 more or less the same scene and you 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 get to kind of see the kind of changes in season you get to see the changes in the kind of creatures that are coming or the changes in in the, so there's a conversation that's happening with um shifts in time shifts in time and shifts in space i just wanted people to be able to see the the scale of these as well because obviously that's something that's hard to to grapple with when you're just looking at a, a slideshow but if i understand right from you because i've never seen these in person um but they're printed on a kind of watercolor paper right so they also have they're a printed um, on, they're printed on somerset velvet paper and they're a they're slightly larger than life size again intentional because I wanted that idea that I didn't want them to be so so small operating like a a miniature would in the sense of the scale or so gargantuan that they uh, they become overwhelming I wanted there to be almost a one-to-one parity with the human scale that one could feel one was tumbling into the frame and I wanted the texture of the paper to, to be something that's tangible that on one level yes you're looking at an image but on another level, you're also aware of the surface of that the the image as well, so that you've got that kind of dual that dual awareness as well. Thinking back to what you were just saying earlier about photography and time, your falling series from 2005 is a really interesting way of. Well, I mean, I'd love to hear you talk about it, but just my my immediate thought that I wanted to share now was that there's there's another kind of reductive truism about photography that it freezes a single moment in time exactly as it is then and then archives it forever. And one of the things that I love about this series is how it kind of flips that assumption inside out because you're returning to this experiential fleeting childhood memory and then creating a series of possible moments where you can kind of open up a durational space that is not just momentary. I mean, you sense the kind of movement and time that's passed even in this one shot, like with the, or you wouldn't be able to see the blurry helicopter there, right, with the sycamore seeds. So maybe tell us a little bit about about this series and, and how it arose. 
Uh, again, I I say I think at about the time you know when sustenance when I was making sustenance and you know this actually is a, a really good point as well that we can talk about bodies of work in a very kind of clean chronological way but really it's a lot rougher and a lot more messy idea that's productive. I tend to work on two or three different things at the same time so that I don't get too caught up and and, and, and too tight with one thing and things take um, a, a different different times to kind of get going or, or, or spool. So falling was, uh, was, a, was an idea that was incubating when I was uh, on my way to, to moving back to the UK and you know, I, I do think a lot about childhood memories or childhood experiences how, how something felt and it was that sense of wonder but also that sense of, of loss of not being able to really experience something as I would want to experience it was I able to control every element of of nature and so you're seeing these sycamore seeds mid-flight that haven't quite landed you haven't quite seen where they they've they've come from so it's a moment of possibility that kind of in between and I was talking recently to somebody about the notion of falling and how that can be seen as a, a destabilizing place to be but actually if you can become comfortable with falling that actually brings you a sense of stability, possibly not articulating it well, but it is something from a, from a philosophical uh, a philosophical dimension, an Eastern philosophical dimension about how to be at one with a sense of instability. And if you think about it, we're all on a gigantic, gigantic lump of rock and flying through uh, in an orbit through in, in, in the universe. And when you can't think of it like that, you think, hmm, it doesn't seem like we're that stable, really. <laughs> yeah, so we are always falling. Yeah, always. I mean, I can, and I can see this is where I see your your identity as well as a um, a kind of meditation instructor and a practitioner of yoga as being such a I don't know it's so deeply embedded in in these pieces this this sense of kind of cultivating a way of being you know opening up a space within a moment and and mm -hmm. and being open to the possibility of being with the change following the change you know, kind of drifting with it and not fighting it. You know, and I wasn't conscious at the time, Chitra, when I was making these things, um, my meditation practice was of a particular type. I was practicing, I, I wasn't serious about yoga. I wasn't serious about meditation. That came some years later for that to be a, a, a very kind of important part of, you know, who I say that, that I am. You know, I don't ever just say anymore that I'm an artist. I don't ever just say I'm, I'm a a yoga practitioner and teacher or, 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 a, or a meditator you know they're all they're all very um important ways for me to engage and connect and uh, wonderful to have the insight that I could come back to look at this work from the perspective of having a deeper engagement with meditation and yoga to be able to reframe and re-articulate this work using a, a, a language that I hadn't used before it doesn't detract from the way that I used to articulate these works but I have a richer vocabulary now because of because of that that very practical engagement with yoga and that very practical engagement with meditation and that the, you can't just stay in your head it's very important to acknowledge the importance of the body in terms of getting some an understanding of the, the uh, an understanding of, of how things are how reality is yeah, I mean, there's also a, a kind of clearly a very um, explicit engagement with some of the kind of early and powerful images from the from, from the earliest years of photography, right, for you. This is an example of an early um, photogram uh, made by William Henry Fox Talbot, one of the one of the inventors of, of, of the photographic processes. This piece stopped me in my tracks when I first saw it in the Talbot archive at the British Library. And when I came across your Falling series, I thought of it immediately. And um, you told me recently that the Falling series is also meant it doesn't have a single orientation right it's that each of them has been each of those um, shots has been chosen so that it can be oriented in any way um and that also is a it kind of interestingly harkens back to the early history of the medium where from a moment in photo history the 1840s when photographs were displayed not hung on a wall but kind of um arranged on a table mm -hmm. horizontally for people to kind of walk around and view from different angles and the way that the kind of the, the technique of making kind of compels that lack of orientation because of course these are spruce needles scattered on a photosensitive paper and then kind of pressed down with a piece of glass and exposed in the sun horizontally 
when you showed me this image, I was so excited because I was like, yes, you know, I, you know, I've been very aware that I've been having a conversation with Talbot's work. I mean, on one level, as a photographer, you're having a conversation with Talbot's, Talbot's work. You're having a conversation with that historical lineage. But then again, in terms of the subject, the, the, the subject matter that, you know, are you looking up? Are you looking down? Are you looking straight ahead? What is the relationship between the image and the viewer? So, um, you know, when I shot those those images of falling, that was with my camera pointing straight up at the sky. And I it just didn't make sense with that series for there to be right. That seemed arbitrary and I just wanted to dispense with it altogether. So I, I do say when, whenever that work's exhibited, please, you know, orient whichever way, whichever way because then they, they, they have been selected so they can be be shown any which way and I'm very flattered to have that connection and conversation with with Talbot's work because there's a love there's a love for his materials there's a love for the subject matter there's a love for the process there's something very I don't know what for want for a better term poetic about about what he was doing it wasn't something about being rational and scientific um you know he he, he he talked about photography being the pencil of nature, which I I really I really connect with. But he's almost saw photography as being alchemical, being magical, and that's not lost on me. That's that's something that still keeps me um, still keeps me um, connected to photography. Yeah, and I think the work it kind of it, it it brings out that kind of magical I think response in in viewers as well when they apprehend them. Yeah, and so this is um this is from your series Cosmoses, which is from a few years later, right, from two thousand six to seven so, or so. I think uh, falling was completed in two thousand and five, yeah. and then um, I went into making these photograms, the Cosmoses series between two thousand and six to two thousand and seven. Took me a while to. to to make, to make a lot of these, these flowers, uh, um, obsessively so. I, I do have an, a quite an obsessive element, which works well if you want to do things like this. So this series was where was where I really, I guess, was having a, a, a more direct conversation with Henry Fox Fulbert, um, Anna Atkins, looking at those 19th century photographers who were depicting botanical specimens. So it kind of been there already with sustenance and looking at, at this an engagement with this through through the photogram process and, and cosmoses in particular I wanted because I the, the the term comes from the Greek to mean um, ordered whole harmonious but yet it's also the name of this flower that's got perfectly symmetrical petals um, around the center so you've got and then you've got with photograms as well this direct indexical trace that origami flower was there on that piece of paper at that point in time so it's you know I'm fascinated with that that kind of sense of a trace that you get from a photogram that relationship to truth or that conversation with truth yeah and then it's 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 interesting then to kind of you know following this flower motif through your work to this or orchidomania collaboration with Melanie Rose um, and thinking about that that sort of that that sense of the direct connection between the flower and the paper, and then the materiality of the sort of complexity of the process that you worked on with Melanie to, to produce these orchid portraits, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there is also that kind of conversation with the early history of photography in this yeah. series as well, because of the, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the context in which you made, which led to this collaboration. But I also think as well, there's, I like to make some works on my own, but I also love the, the surprise elements that come out of working with in a, in a, in a collaborative vein that there's a big aspect of trust that comes into that that what is what is one willing to do for the sake of the the, the work and I'm motivated by that that notion of synergy that two you know individuals can come together and through that engagement something quite wonderful and unforeseen can can occur so I've been very fortunate that um, my my experience of, of collaborations has been has been positive. So um, this came out of a commission for the Glyn Vivian Gallery. So I was approached by Katie Freer, the, cu the, the curator, to make work in response to uh, an exhibition that was being planned called A Moon and a Smile. And it was a wonderful commission. Very loosely, the idea was to make some work 
that in some shape or form references the the life and work of a gentleman Victorian botanical photographer John Dillwyn Llewellyn and so along with a uh, and and this was open to uh, um, female artists so we all went and and spent a couple of days having a look at some archives of John Dillwyn Llewellyn's work as well as actually going to see where his house was and uh, Mel and I were fascinated at the ruins of a, a an orchid house that were on the grounds and he is known in orchid circles for a particular to a greenhouse which meant that certain orchid specimens that he was getting collected from you know and this was a, a, a very big industry in the 19th century of collectors going off to uh, various parts of the world and bringing back specimens to 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 the UK so um, John Tilwin Llewellyn was was very actively engaged in 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 getting orchids that he could then he could then cultivate at home so we were taken with that and we then did extensive research looking into the orchids that uh, that he grew so we were researching the archives are at, at Kew and we were looking at the letters that he had been writing with the directors of Kew Gardens and in one of those letters he talked about how he was undergoing a bout of orchidomania and as I thought of this work it's me it just sounds like such a contemporary term but here we are reading reading this from um you know something that was made in uh, written about in the 19th century so and we'd also been looking at an old technique called cliche fair which in a way combines elements of drawing and painting and photography and that appealed to us because with Mel being a painter and I have never considered myself strictly as a as a photographer I I I like to I like to make work and whatever whatever medium suits the idea that I want the idea that I have I'm 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 that's that's what I want to use so we did quite a bit of experimenting and we we got jpegs of, of, of as, as, as far as we were able to track the orchids that we knew that um John Dillwyn Llewellyn had grown we then found images online of those flowers and a certain number of them, because we, we were working towards a, a commission deadline, we then made negative and positive images on, on acetate. So we made ones that were small enough to actually put into a dark um, a dark room and larger. And then we made acetates that were about just, just under 16 by 12 so that that would be the contact print. So that would be more like, you know, what you would see with a conventional photogram. So and by slightly misregistering them in the in the dark room, you get this three dimensional effect that so the images actually vibrate. So this was very very much kind of process led. In all of this, it was it was incredibly exciting. So it almost felt like you know could be like tall, but just having this discovery and going, oh wow, didn't expect, but it's let's go with this. So um, so we made these images and also on the far right, so this is this is from the exhibition of Moon and a Smile at, at the Glen Vivian. You can see a strip of wallpaper and so that's a couple of the orchid uh, images. We um, we then screen printed the um, the wallpaper, and we loved the process of making a screen printed wallpaper, and it, it sparked off for both of us in our then subsequent independent work uh, a, a fascination with screen printing. Yeah, that's a good moment. We're we're coming up to the point where we need to switch to the Q and A, but I wanted to make sure we have a chance to share some of the recent work that you've been doing using Colograph, using screen printing, and just yeah, could you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on lately, and yeah, what you're up to in this work? I feel like I've I've gone back to pick up some strands of things that I was engaged with that I loved that I just haven't been back to in a long time. And many, many, many years ago, when I was delving into printmaking, the two aspects of printmaking I, I really loved were screen printing and making holographs. And earlier this year, I was I was on a, I was on a course to learn more about screen printing. But as as part of that part time course I was doing, uh, we got the opportunity to actually work with colographs and put them through an etching press. And that reigniting of a of, of a love of colographs came out of it. So this is a, a piece that I made uh, quite recently, where this is um, handmade Bhutanese paper. I think it's about sixteen by twenty eight centimeters, so it's not a particularly large piece. And 
this is a blind emboss, so it's not done with any ink. I've just cut uh, a piece of mount card and you, you can probably just about see the kind of grid lines that I've cut into it. So again, this um, miniature detail with things and, and, and quite obsessively and patiently to, to, to build to build this image. So this comes out of looking at some images of the Big Bang not actual images of the Big Bang, but depictions of the Big Bang. So it's inspired by this gargantuan cosmic occurrence. And it's I'm, I'm going to make a few more of these. These, these It was the, the idea that these perfect forms, these equilateral triangles have come out of this, that they're every, everything that exists, uh, practical and theoretical, there isn't anything that exists that hasn't come out of that the, the Big Bang, including these perfect forms. So I will be making some more. So we've got a lot of questions lined up here, Anita. I know we have a couple more works in progress to show, but maybe hopefully I can kind of get to them as part of the Q&A. So you mentioned collage a moment ago, and um, one of our listeners asks or, or, or observes that the photographs have almost a feel of collage, given the colors and the compositions, and they want to know if that was intentional. I'm interested in collage. So, you know, collagraphy has that reference to collage. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very definitely interested in that. I went to see an exhibition, an amazing exhibition actually last year in Edinburgh called 400 Years of Cut and Paste. Just one of the, just an amazing exhibition all about collage history. So I came away creatively fed by that. So at some point, I feel that I'm, I'm, I'm definitely making reference to collage in, in, in these collagraphs and that collage as we kind of tend to, to know it, be that digital collage collage or, or more traditional analog kind of collage will be something that I will be engaging with quite possibly with both because there's something really lovely about actually doing something physical with, with one's hands I, 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 I don't want to always do things that are just about being on, on, a, on a computer I have to get away and get working with my hands yeah another listener asks how your yoga and meditation practice relate to the art making practice and you mentioned earlier that there's some of the works where I thought I saw that presence the most it wasn't actually a kind of conscious part of your identity yet how they relate could you just say the first bit of that question again please Chitra yeah how does your yoga and meditation practice relate to your art making practice I see them as different means of ex expressing myself, my relationship with authenticity, my relationship with truth, to try and create a space through which a connection or a communication can uh, can occur. It's about from silence and from paying from paying attention. Many many references I can make beyond the time that we have. <laughs> I'm just flipping through some of the other works in progress as I navigate some of these questions. Yeah, maybe you could tell us also a little bit about what your studio routine is like. For the those in the audience who don't know, the UK is under a kind of full lockdown right now because of the pandemic. And so people really are kind of closed up at home. Tell us about what your day is like and how your practice kind of helps you get through these challenging times. Well, it's wonderful to have this group huddle with everybody virtually in my in my studio. So this is this is my creative hub. This, this is my, with my work. So I don't I don't have a set routine. But what I like about the fact that my studio is at the bottom of the garden is that if I've got thirty minutes, or I've got an hour, or I've got you know a, a larger tract of time, then I can come in here. I've always got some work out so that when I come back in again, I can jump back straight into it. So I, I, I always leave my studio with something still in, still in progress. And as I was saying before, I don't tend to work on just one thing at, at a time. So I am messing about with things photographic. I'm making these I've been making these grid drawings uh, for the past year. I'm excited to see how they've been evolving. And they've actually been, I think, the thing that really made me go, oh, Indian miniatures again, the, 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 the detail. And the making of the colographs is, is what, for this particular piece called Exuberance, is where I introduced cutting into the paper. So I'm certainly going to, I'm in the process of making some more that have got the pieces of uh, pieces cut out of the, cut out of the drawings. So I don't, I don't have a set routine. I just make sure that there's time spent every day being creative because if I'm, if I don't, I get very cranky. <laughs> just have a meditation practice. <laughs> so my yoga students watching this are probably thinking me to get cranky. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> everyone gets cranky so yes it's been very important to me to have my art practice uh I mean 
you know, we talked earlier in the summer after the George Floyd incident, probably affected by by that because of, you know, as a, as a, as a practitioner of a breath-based meditation, as somebody that, that that teaches that, that, you know, I think I said to you, there isn't a day that I don't think about the the, the breath and it's how it's a, a very, um, a very important vehicle through which one develops a relationship with oneself and to to witness that being extinguished um was was traumatic and i had to really spend some time finding a way to get back into feeling that i could have a voice through my 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 art so it's you know it's great that you put these images up these were some screen prints that i made uh last year they're still very much a work in progress but it was these these lines are taken from an ancient text that's kind of one of the kind of main the seminal text of Thera- Theravada Buddhism and it's 16 lines that talk about the mindfulness of breathing so breathe in aware of pleasure breathe out aware of pleasure breathe in a short breath breathe out a, sh- uh, a short breath so I'm just, just excited about a way of, of, of creating this connection between my meditation practice the breath-based meditation practice and how that comes out through making these screen printed posters so yes, working for is still something I I I, uh, I intend to, to to put some time and energy into when we get beyond lockdown. Um, we have another question about female agency in your work, and so uh, you referenced Manet's Olympia, the the passive nude female figure in classical art, and so um, we have a question that asks whether the whether you believe that the concept of female agency is still kind of driving the rest of your work and what its role is in the contemporary art now? Well, as a female artist outside of the experiences that I have as a, as a female artist, I can't step outside of the fact that I I live in a body that's subject to the things that happen to you when you're, you know, um, going through the, the perimenopause and the menopause. Um, it doesn't stay isolated into one part of one's being. It's all part being there for how one interacts with everybody and, and everything so I you know in flora for me it was something that I wanted to examine overtly and also the conversations that I had with my friends at the time about feeling off to the side because you're no longer you're no longer in your 20s and it's something you know that I'm I'm, a, I'm aware of with I can't remember that point where I noticed you know that you would get looked at or you would get whistled at uh, and I was always uncomfortable with it. And now it's, you know, I notice I don't get looked at. I find that quite liberating, actually. But, you know, there's a point in time where that happens and you think, that's kind of really interesting. How do you, you know, where where do you get repositioned in society because of your age and the way that you that you look? So definitely it's, it's there in the work. It's just the case of when in the future what what how will that be teased out will it be something that I make work about in a in a, in a very forthright way or is it going to be there in terms of uh, a more subtle articulation in terms of how I I communicate about the work but it's not something that I can uh, I can't about that, that answers that question um, we have another question that is specific to the grid drawing I showed earlier, so I'm just going to flip back to it for a moment. Um, so, yeah, so this uh, this person noted that this grid drawing looked like it could be converted into a woven fabric. Mm. And um, they wonder, have you ever thought of working with a weaver and engaging in a different medium with these kind of patterns and techniques? It's something I'm conscious of. I mean, I love the work of Annie Annie Albers, um, I've got one of her her, her, her her notebook drawings and I have been looking just naturally because of what I've been doing, I have been looking at the work and also friends have, have, have said to me, oh, you know, you need to go and have a look at the work of, of this, this textile artist and uh, a family friend who's uh, um, very, uh, very passionate, engaged with, with quilting. Sometimes when she's seen my images going, that would make a really good quilt. So I know that that conversation is is there. And I guess I should be more engaged because my mother was a seamstress. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think I'm 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 open to it at the minute. I'm so ex- I'm I'm so uh, immersed in wanting to make the drawings because every time I make one drawing, I have an idea for about ten more, and I get excited. You know, I, ha- I have these wonderful dreams about when I go to sleep, and I'm, I'm meant to be sleeping, but I'm actually getting really excited about oh, I could do that, and I could change that, and it all looks really amazing in my dreams. And then I wake up and go. I 
I don't think that's going to work or maybe something will. So I do a lot of problem solving at night in my in my dreams and, and, and often in my meditation. I would say my meditation has really helped broaden my creativity. I've never been short of ideas, but it, it's gone to another another degree. So, um, yes, if the opportunity presents itself or some compelling idea comes along, which this needs to be done in this way it needs to be it needs to be done through embroidery or through thread work then um then definitely I'll, i will be i will be hunting out a sewing machine or something to to make some work so when thinking about kind of roving across media like that depending on what the you know what the project or the thing you're preoccupied with compels is there um and this is, i'm paraphrasing a question that that's come through in the q a is, is there a kind of hierarchy of of media that maybe you absorbed or were taught in you know in graduate school or in art school that has been either an obstacle or a or a kind of scaffolding for kind of accessing different media like that for you I've always felt it's very for me I've kind of lived by the concept the concept leads the medium and you know sometimes I look at I look at some you know somebody who's, who's stayed with a particular medium and I just think oh you know I, I I sometimes think I wish I could be like that that I could have the time to really bed in and know something really really well but I've I've made my peace with the fact that it's just not how I think it's just not how I I work uh and if I thought for example that I was going to stay with photography and that I would never draw again or that I would never make color graphs I would mourn that disconnect with those things and if I thought I was going to never touch photography again that that would that would cause me some 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 disturbance so I've you know the, the, the logical conclusion is you know work will take as long as it it takes and it will come out the way that it comes out and I'm and I'm I'm okay with that it'll it'll all make it'll make sense to me <laughs> it'll all make you know it, you know hopefully it'll make sense to, to to others in the full in the fullness of time I got I got known as a photographer because of that sustenance series when I was I when that was finished and went out into the world it's a series that opened up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for me and I'm very grateful for that but the other side of that has been that yes I have sometimes been pigeonholed as a photographer and yeah I just don't see that as being kind of really relevant to what I what I do and if I've got a, a good compelling idea to make some photographs I will do that as I will draw and, and in fact you know I was making grid drawings when I was at the museum school I was making them in, in around about 2001-2002 it's just that I got to a point halfway through my my grad program where I had to make a decision about making a cohesive body of work for my thesis show so I kind of had to choose between the drawings I was making and the sustenance series and so I, I opted for the sustenance series but that unfinished engagement that unfinished conversation I had with that work it's been fantastic to come back to that and go just to kind of pick up from where I I don't want to quite say pick up from where I left off because I haven't because I've had all this experience of all these other things that I've done but pick up from that that love and that thrill and that that absorption in 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 the ideas that I was engaged with and find them loop back to that fascination that I've had with Indian miniatures which I really want to delve into more deeply. Well thank you so much Nita. I'm afraid our hour is up and so I just want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with me and to invite all of us participating in this webinar to into your studio to reflect with you on your practice. I've never had so many people in my studio. <laughs> And I want to thank especially all of our viewers as well um, for your thoughtful questions and engagement with Nika's work. Before we go, I'd just like to remind everyone that um, the Center's next online artist con conversation will be on Friday, December 4th at 12 p.m. Eastern Time with artist Tony Foster in conversation with Duncan Robinson, who's the former director at the Center and, and the Fitzwilliam Museum and the University of Cambridge. So thank you to Nika. Thank you to everyone. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you, everybody.